Well, good morning, church. We are really, really excited to be here with you guys this Sunday. And like I said uh, at the very beginning, we're especially excited because we're jumping into Galatians today. And, and uh, I'll say this again in a second. I think that this Galatians series is going to be the most significant series that I've preached here as your teaching pastor. I'll tell you why in a little bit, but I think it is going to be life-changing, not only for many of us in this room, but potentially a game-changer for our community as well. But before we do that, there's something that I'm really excited about that I want you to let you know about. Uh, we are going to be hosting this spring a women's conference for our entire community. It's on April 24th and 25th. It's called Breathe. And, and listen, I know that that's a long way off. Like April seems like forever away as we're driving through the ice to get here. But, but here's what you need to know. We had our first program team meeting this past week, and I'm really excited for it. We're inviting in Lynn McKendrick. Uh, she's the former teaching uh, lead for Bible Study Fellowship uh, here in the area. She's an unbelievable speaker. The topic is going to be life-changing. I think we're going to talk about God's love, like God's actual love for who, those who follow Jesus. And when you get that at the core of your identity, how it changes everything. We're, we've planned out the conference so it will actually be beneficial in your walk with the Lord. You know, you go to a lot of conferences, and they get you for 24 or 36 hours, and they so jam-pack that 24 to 36 hours that you leave just as exhausted as when you stepped into the conference. We're very specifically not doing that. We're providing space for you ladies to breathe. Do you see what I did there? Uh, and as you meet with Jesus. And so listen, if you are uh, a lady in this room from, you know, 12 to uh, uh, older than 12. If you're in any of those age ranges, we'd love for you to come to our women's conference. It is going to be awesome. I think that there are going to be women who are blessed all over our area. So you should figure out how to sign up. We have an early bird registration deadline coming up. Uh, I believe it's on January 20th, uh, but we'd love for, for you to get signed up. If you're a husband in this room, here's what I want to challenge you to do. You need to make space for your wife to come to the women's conference. And a little life hack tip. Are you guys ready for this? There's going to be child care for the entire conference, so it's kind of like a retreat for you guys, too. So you want to make it uh, so that your wives can come. And, and listen, you should not only sign yourself up, but you should think about how to get your whole neighborhood, your mom, your sister, your, your daughter, you just get everybody you can to, to come on out to our women's conference. It's April 24th and 25th. It is going to be awesome, awesome. All right. Have you ever found yourself overwhelmed just as you do life? Have you ever found yourself overwhelmed? This past week as I was preparing this sermon, I found myself overwhelmed by where we're at as a culture. I was overwhelmed because, you know, I'd hop on to my favorite news website. You hopped on to your favorite news website. I was writing this sermon on Monday afternoon, and I'd click on to my favorite news website, and the top three headlines were that we're going to a war with Iran, that all of Australia, like all of it, is on fire. And then we have a president who's currently impeached, but no trial is imminent as if nobody in Congress can read the Constitution. And I read all of those things in the news, and to be honest, I just get overwhelmed. I get overwhelmed by where our culture is going sometimes. I've, I'm reading these books right now about the impact of the sexual revolution on our particular cultural moment. I'm specifically reading books about how the philosophy and ideology of the sexual revolution is filtering down into what they're teaching our kids in, our, in the elementary schools uh, in our country. And to be honest, I read about it and it makes me overwhelmed. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by where our culture is going spiritually, to be honest with you guys. I read a book about a month and a half ago about a Canadian philosopher named Charles Taylor. And listen, I know what you're thinking. What's the title of that book? Because I want to get it and read it right now. Uh, here's what Charles Taylor says about our cultural moment. He says that secular people in the West, in the 21st century West, secular people no longer think that Christianity is wrong. A Charles Taylor assess assessment is that secular people in our culture think that Christianity is impossible and irrelevant. And I read this book about the philosophy of this guy who seems smart, and I'm thinking in my head, like, how do you even have a conversation with people who think that? Like, how do you even have a conversation with somebody who says that Christianity is impossible and irrelevant, and I get overwhelmed? And one of the things that happens when I get overwhelmed is I begin to ask questions. One of the main questions I ask is, how did we get here? Like, how did we get here as a culture, politically, culturally, spiritually? How did we get here? I found myself getting overwhelmed by what's happening in our area. Kate and I, we went to grab dinner with some friends of ours, and uh, they have a really beautiful four-month-old uh, da four daughter. <laughs> and uh, we're sitting down, and we're grabbing dinner with them, and I'm asking the husband and this couple, hey, tell me about your neighborhood. 
So he points out the front window, and he says, listen, if you were here during the day, you would see that that house across the street's got a single, a single lady living there with a whole bunch of cats. And what you'd find during the day is that basically every 30 minutes throughout the entire day, you see a different car pull into that driveway. Somebody hop out of the front of that car, walk into the house, spend five or ten minutes in the house, and walk back out. And, and what uh, my friend was saying is he thinks that they're selling meth from the house. And then he pointed four houses down in his, in his uh, neighborhood, and he said, that's a flop house. And I had no clue what that meant. And he said, well, a flop house is where uh, an abandoned house where uh, the homeless population, some of them, will go, and they'll shoot up on their drugs, and they'll spend a couple hours flopping. Or it seems like every week recently, I've had conversations with people who are just being, like, crushed by habitual sin, sexual addiction, I'm, I'm having conversations with people who have betrayal and mistrust right in the middle of their marital dynamics, like right now. I'm having conversations with people who are dealing with the hopelessness of mental illness, the hopelessness of physical suffering. And I drive around our city, and I see a church, it seems, like on every street corner, and the question is, why? Like, why so many churches in our area and still so much brokenness? How did we get here? And if I'm really honest with you guys, sometimes I get overwhelmed by what's going on kind of internally as well. If you were here last week, Pat, he gave this really excellent sermon challenging us to remember what it was like when we first met Jesus. If you haven't listened to Pat's sermon, hop on our website. You can go to the podcast or we have a Vimeo channel. You can watch the video of, of Pat giving this sermon. And he challenges, hey, remember what it was like to meet Jesus. So I did. I remembered what it was like to have the freedom and the joy of knowing that Jesus has taken every one of my sins on his shoulders. And he's given me the salvation that I've deep down for my entire life longed for. And I've been following Jesus for almost two decades at this point. I was able to look back at uh, my time of following Jesus. And there's these points where he's very clearly brought freedom to different areas in my life. But then there was a flip side of that coin. See, if I'm really honest, when I look back over the course of my walk with the Lord, what I see is, man, I still struggle right now in ways that I never thought I would still struggle 10 or 20 years ago. Sometimes I struggle with the exact same things that it felt like I was struggling with when I first came to know Jesus. Have you ever been there? Like, have you ever had that moment in your head where you've thought, hey, am I missing something here? Like, is there some ingredient to Christianity that, like, everybody else knows about, but I just don't know about, and I'm just, like, here, left struggling with this thing? And I ask the question, how do I get here? How did I get to this place? You see, if we're really honest... Some of us, we have to ask questions like, how do we get here? How do we get here in our world, politically, culturally, and spiritually? How do we get here in our area, like, so church and still so broken? How did some of us get here individually, still struggling, for real struggling with stuff? How did we get here? I was thinking about that question. And I was reminded of a quote from uh, a theologian named D.A. Carson. If you've never read Don Carson, he's probably the most influential theologian in the past 40 or so years in evangelical Christianity. And D.A. Carson says this, When a culture merely accepts the gospel, when a generation merely accepts the gospel, the next generation will assume the gospel. When that next generation assumes the gospel, then the third generation will forget the gospel. When one generation merely accepts the gospel, the next generation will assume the gospel. When that next generation assumes the gospel, then the third generation will forget the gospel. Guess where we are right now as a culture? Guess where too many places in our area are living right now here in Southwest Missouri? Cards on the table? Guess where some of us are at in this season of life? How have we gotten here? Well, evangelical Christianity too often has forgotten the fact that God is not interested in us merely accepting the gospel. And he's certainly not interested in whole generations of people assuming or forgetting the gospel. We've failed to see that God's not interested in us merely accepting the gospel. He's not interested in us assuming the gospel. And he's certainly not interested in us forgetting the gospel. You see, the God of the universe wants his people to actually believe and actually treasure the goodness of the good news of the gospel. Want to know where real Christian freedom comes from? Like, want to know where real Christian joy and peace comes from? It happens when you actually, at a heart level, believe and treasure the gospel. Want to know what our area needs more than it needs another church and another not-for-profit? 
Our area, more than anything else, needs bodies of believers, communities of Christians who really actually treasure and believe the gospel. Want to know how we're going to see our world change, how we're going to see our country transformed by Jesus. It will happen when evangelical Christianity kills its love of glitz and celebrity and power and we collectively begin to believe and treasure the gospel again. This is why I think that this series is the most significant series I've preached here as a teaching pastor. Because the stakes are high. Listen, I really do believe that some of you in this room are going to experience real freedom and real joy for the first time in your walk with the Lord. I'm not saying you're going to become a Christian. I'm just saying you're going to experience the benefits of your Christianity for real for the first time. I think the stakes are high for our area. Want to know why Fellowship Bible Church exists on Farm Road 205? We talked last week about how God provides for our church, like over and over again, miraculously providing for us. Want to know why he does that? I think he does that because we as a community, we get to show our whole area what sort of transformative, countercultural things can happen when a whole group of people begin to actually treasure and actually believe the gospel. Now, friends, here's the good news. When the gospel grabs us, Like when the Holy Spirit gives us eyes to see and hearts to feel just how beautiful the goodness of the good news of the gospel is. You want to know what the result is? Revival. I've been walking around this room all week praying that God would spark revival in our midst. Like personal revival for some of us, corporate revival, in our world revival. Listen, if you're new with us, I have a challenge for you. I don't want you to make fellowship your forever church necessarily. Here's my challenge. Give me three months. Let's see what the Lord does as we walk through Galatians and we spend week after week sitting underneath the goodness of the good news of the gospel. If you're a member or regular attender here, I want to ask you to join me in praying that God would do God-sized things in our midst as we sit underneath what I think to be the most explosive letter in all of the New Testament. So I'm going to pray that God would move again. And then we're going to jump into Galatians 1. Is that good? Pray with me. Jesus, we love you. And God, we don't just want to come here and sing some songs and hear a sermon and uh, give our tithes and offerings and leave change. God, we want to meet with you here. God, we want your name, your fame, the goodness of the good news of your gospel to actually change us in, in some practical, tangible ways as we sit in our chairs underneath your word. So God, I pray that you would do that. Speakers can't do that. Uh, Worship bands can't do that, but you can. God, change our hearts. Meet us in this place. And God, I do pray for this Galatians series that you would do God-sized things in our midst, that freedom would come, joy would be experienced, lives would be transformed by the goodness of the good news of your gospel for us. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, uh, What stirs emotions in your life? Think about it. Like what are the things that cause you to most easily be mad or most easily be sad? I would submit to you that the things that stir emotions in your life, they stir emotions because you care about them. This is why parenting is is so emotional. Over, uh, Over Christmas break, my daughter Charlotte got pneumonia, which was a bummer for her. It was also a bummer. Let's not think about her though. Think about me. It was also a bummer for me because I can very easily get on Google and WebMD and find out just how many things could have caused that pneumonia and what if it's antibiotic resistant and how many things could be going far worse for Charlotte, but it just presents as pneumonia. And I'm reading about all of these things that could be happening in the lungs of my daughter and I'm getting sad, like awkwardly sad, like one of those dad moments, you know what I'm talking about? Why? Like, why do I so easily walk down that road when my daughter or my son gets sick? Well, because I care dearly for my daughter. So she stirs emotions in me. Or uh, for as long as I can remember, I've always gotten, like, really mad at injustice. Like, things that I perceive to be unfair, they just, like, they, they really, they tick me off. And so I was watching uh, the highlights of an NFL playoff game. And when I see that the final play is, is this— Guess what it stirs in my heart? I don't even care about the New Orleans Saints, but that's very clearly offensive pass interference. And so I'm thinking about how do I get Roger Goodell on the phone so I can tell him what he should do in this particular moment? Why does that make me mad? Well, because I care deeply about 
injustice. I, I care deeply about seeing injustice corrected, unfairness not have a place in our world. What we're going to see in Galatians is what stirs emotions in Paul. Specifically, we're going to see what makes the Apostle Paul mad. Spoiler alert, want to know what makes the, the Apostle Paul mad? It makes Paul mad when people veer away from the gospel. It makes Paul mad when people merely accept, assume, or forget the gospel. You see, Paul gets mad around issues related to the gospel, which means that he clearly cares about the gospel, which leads us to a question as we kick off this series. What is this gospel that Paul cares so deeply about? Paul's not going to let us get out of the first five verses of his letter to the churches in Galatia without telling us exactly what the gospel is that he cares so deeply about. So if you have your Bibles, meet me in Galatians 1. Galatians 1. As you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of context. Galatia is a region in the southern part of modern-day Turkey. More than likely, Paul walked through this region on his first missionary journey, planted some churches in that area. Those churches likely planted some other churches. But now, five years down the road, uh, these churches were just a hot mess. There's false teachers in their midst. There's conflict. There's very real sin and racism just pervading everything that they do. So Paul writes them a letter. It's called Galatians. We're going to start in verse 1. Galatians 1. First one, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Now follow me on this. There's a couple of things to note right in this first verse. In the New Testament, there are both big A apostles and little a apostles. Big A apostles were the group of men in the early church that were, uh, had been with Jesus physically and were given the task of leading the early church. It is the message of these big A apostles that we have in the New Testament. In the New Testament, there are also little a apostles, which are more or less equivalent to modern-day missionaries for us. Paul is making an argument in this letter that he is a big A apostle. That is a radical argument to make. The other thing to notice here, look down at the very end of verse 1. Through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. What we see is that in the New Testament, constantly Jesus is placed as God side by side with God the Father. Jesus is God. God the Father is God. This is why we believe that the Christian God is a trinity. The word trinity, you won't find it a single place in the New Testament or the Old Testament. But the concept is there virtually from cover to cover. Our God, the Christian God, is, is one God three persons, or as the old uh, creeds put it, he's one substance, three essences. Now that's confusing, but it's also beautiful. And if you have questions about it, we're going to cover the Trinity for an entire morning during Equip Life in the next couple of weeks. You should go there. Chris Hanner will answer every question that you ever had about the Trinity. Seriously, you won't have another question again your entire life. Who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There it is again. Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. If you like to underline your Bibles, let me encourage you to underline verses 4 and 5. Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel is quite literally good news. And right at the beginning of his letter, Paul, he wants his readers and us, by the way, to know just why the gospel is such good news. You see, Paul says the gospel is good news first about who we are. It's good news about who we are. You see, there's a very interesting word in our passage that you might have skipped over. It's the word rescue. Now, what kind of person do you rescue? The type of people you rescue are people who are hopeless and lost. You see, right in verse 4 there, Paul is using a word that is pregnant with meaning to make a proclamation for us about humanity, specifically that we as humans are hopeless and lost. Now, this is absolutely radical, and it's absolutely life change. See, most people, they approach Jesus for some help. My life is a little bit messed up, and I need Jesus to help me make my life right. I, I, I'm a, I have some sin in my life, and I need Jesus to help me earn salvation. And, and listen, I'm a little depressed. I need Jesus to help me make myself 
happy. I ran a, a 5K over Thanksgiving, a turkey trot in my wife's hometown there in the Quad Cities, Illinois and Iowa. And I, I ran it because it was my, my New Year's resolution. Now, if you approach New Year's resolutions like I approached New Year's resolutions, I made the resolution January 2019, and then February 2019, I forgot about it. And so for, you know, most of the year, wasn't thinking about running a 5K. Then finally, about halfway through October, I thought, well, I had this resolution to run a 5K. And so I thought, you know, maybe that will become my 2020 resolution. You know how that goes, right? And so for a couple of weeks there at the end of October, I thought I'd just kick it to 2020. And then finally, at the beginning of November, I decided, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow through on this thing. We'll do the turkey trot. I signed up. I paid money, which means I actually have to do it. And so I began running in the gym. Kind of getting myself ready. I don't want to die running up the hill there in Davenport, Iowa. And, uh, and so by the time I got to the actual race, I knew exactly how fast I was going to run. Now, don't judge me. I have short little legs. So I'm going to say how fast I'm going to run, but you're going to judge me. And I'm going to say don't do that. But I, was, I knew that when I started the race, I was probably going to run, you know, nine and a half minute miles. That's probably where I was going to average. And I was probably going to finish in about, uh, about 30 minutes. So we start the race. Run up the hill, down the hill, uh, kind of in this last little straightaway. And then uh, you get to the finish line, and they hand you this receipt. And they tell you your, your average mile time and then how long it took you to finish. So I've, my average mile time was 8 minutes and 20 seconds, and I finished in 26 and a half minutes. So a full minute a mile faster than I normally ran in the gym. Why did I run faster? Well, because I was running with my brother-in-law. And I can't let him beat me. So every time I was tired, every time I got even just a little bit tired, I looked at him, and he helped me run faster. Too many people, they approach Jesus like that. I'm running, Jesus helps me run a little bit faster. I'm moral, Jesus helps me be a little bit more moral. I'm a good dad, Jesus helps me be a better dad. I'm worthy of God's love, and then Jesus kind of fills in the cracks. He spackles with, uh, with his sacrifice every area where I fall short of God's love. But hear me on this. This is radical. Paul does not say that Jesus helps us. What does Paul say? He says that Jesus rescues us. Which means that the better analogy is not me running, looking at my brother-in-law and running faster because of the motivation he gives me. Uh, uh, the better analogy is that I'm drowning. Like in the water, muscles seizing up, head beneath the water, lungs burning, drowning. And what Paul is saying is that Jesus does not stand at the deck of the boat yelling out, flutter kick. What he's saying is that Jesus jumps in the water puts his arms underneath our armpits, and drags us out to safety. Or maybe even the better analogy is that we're lying flat on the back on the shore, and there's no breath in our lungs, there's no beats in our hearts, and what Paul is saying is that Jesus does not stand over top of us and yell, expand your diaphragm. He stoops down, and he breathes life into our lifeless bodies. Jesus rescues us. Church, let me ask you, how do you approach Jesus? Do you approach him as a helper? Or do you approach him as your rescuer? Now listen, this doesn't necessarily sound like good news. Hey, you're hopeless and lost. Happy New Year. That's not, this doesn't sound good. But here's why it is good news. Because you are hopeless and lost. That is true. I'm hopeless and lost too. In most religions and worldviews in our culture, they, they are, are, are proclaiming Swimming lessons to drowning people. Most religions and worldviews in our culture are proclaiming breathing lessons to dead people. Only Christianity meets us where we're actually at, which is hopeless and lost, in need of a rescuer. Second, the good news of the gospel is also what Jesus did for us. The good news is good news about what Jesus did for us. Think about this. What do most churches tell us about what Jesus did for us? And I don't mean on their statements of faith. You know, most churches, they adopted statements of faith decades ago. Nobody ever reads those things again. No, no, but think about most churches. As you engage with their culture, as you look at their song selection, as you look at the lives of their leaders, as you look at what they proclaim on Sunday morning, most churches, what do they tell us about what Jesus did for us? I would submit to you that one type of church in our culture, on this side, maybe we might call them liberal churches, they might say a great many things about Jesus, but what they primarily tell us that Jesus did for us, the main thing that Jesus did for us was to show us the way of love. 
Jesus' primary active activity in our life was to show us the way of love. He gave us an example to show us what it was like to care for and love people around us. And when you live as Jesus lived, loving and accepting people, then you'll have the life that you deep down long for. You see, for churches on this side, Jesus is primarily our example. And he teaches us the way of love. If there's churches on this side, maybe we might call them more conservative churches, and they might say that they believe one thing, but as you spend time in those churches and you look at the lives of their leaders and you look at their song selection, what you see is that they, what they really think that Jesus did for us, like what Jesus really did for us was to teach us the way of morality. He taught us what it's like to not sleep around and to not cheat on our taxes and to not get drunk. Or in our Bible Belt culture, you know, a lot of churches on this side, they don't say that Jesus primarily taught us the way of morality. They say Jesus primarily taught us the way of victory. He teaches us to tap into our, you know, inner warrior, our inner conqueror, and we begin to believe in ourselves, and then we're able to overcome whatever we want to overcome. You see what churches over here are saying, right? They're saying that Jesus is basically our coach, and he teaches us the way of morality, the way of victory. You see, I think if Paul were here, this is going to be hard. I think if Paul were here, he would say that neither of these two types of churches are actually churches. Because neither of these two types of churches are actually preaching the gospel. You see, Jesus does not primarily teach us. He primarily dies for us. Every other worldview and religion has a teacher at its head. Buddhism has Buddha at its head, teaching us how to rise above our emotions. Uh, Islam has Muhammad at its head, teaching us to follow the five pillars. Uh, uh, Liberal-type Christianity has example Jesus at its head, teaching us the way of love. Conservative-type Christianity has Jesus at its head, teaching us the way of morality or the way of victory. But real Christianity has Jesus the Savior who dies for the sins of his people. Do you see how radically different? How stunningly different this is than any other worldview or religion in our culture. If you're a Christian, you're not a Christian because Jesus helped you. You're a Christian because Jesus died for you. He paid for every one of your sins, past, present, and future. He absorbed all of the wrath of God for all of your sins by taking your place on the cross. He actually rescued you. And we're going to see in Galatians, one of the mega themes... If that's how you came to know Jesus, he rescues you, he saves you. If that's how you came to know Jesus, guess how you grow in Jesus? You don't grow in Jesus by, by assuming that he morphs into a coach or, uh, or an example after he's rescued you. No, you grow in Jesus in the same way you came to know Jesus. You bring your sin and your shame to him over and over and over again. And as you do that, as you bring your sin and shame to him and you receive the goodness of his grace, his gospel begins to melt your heart. My prayer all week is that God would give us eyes to see just how beautiful, good, and life-changing this gospel is. How beautiful, life-changing the good news of God's grace actually is for us. We hear it over and over again, but I don't want us to just hear it. I want us to feel it. Third, the gospel is good news because of why Jesus died for us. Uh, According to verse 3, Jesus died for our peace. If you happen to read any kind of cultural pundits in in our particular moment, what you'll find is that cultural pundits, psychologists, they're saying that there is an uneasiness to the modern conscience. Uh, our, Our culture as a whole is comparing ourselves, demeaning ourselves, giving ourselves the beat down as we're comparing the lowest moments of our lives with everybody's highlight projected on social media. We are racked by shame and guilt and fear and anxiety. We have no peace until... We hear the gospel. See, the good news is that we need a rescuer, and Jesus is exactly the rescuer that we need. And when we hear that good news, when we hear that the only opinion of us that truly matters is the opinion of God himself, and because of Jesus, God's opinion of us is that we are his beloved children. When you hear that, you know what the result is? Peace that surpasses understanding begins to get dropped bit by bit into our hearts. Jesus died to secure our peace, but that's not the only reason he died. He also died, according to verse 5, to glorify God the Father. 
You see, God the Father planned to save actual people. His will was for the salvation of his people. Why? Because he gets all the glory when he saves people by his grace. Christian, who saved you? God did. Praise him. Christian, who is the one who authored the goodness of the good news of the gospel? God did. Praise him. And now check this out. This is theological, but if you get it, it'll change your life. Check this out. Now, as a Christian, God's glory and your peace are tied together. God is glorified by bringing peace to his people through the rescue provided by his son, which means as sure as it is that God will be glorified in our universe, as sure as that is, it is equally as sure that God will keep his people in the peace of their salvation forever. Your salvation and your standing before God is not tied to your emotions, your morality, or your success. It's tied to God's glory. And friends, there is no more sure thing in the entire universe than that God will be glorified. Now, I've been doing ministry for uh, almost 15 years at this point. I've preached this sermon this type of sermon, not this exact sermon, but this type of sermon, multiple times. Here's the problem with this sermon. Can I tell you about it? The problem with this sermon is most people hear this sermon and think, yeah, that is really good news for those non-Christians. Get them, pastor. Do you see who Paul's writing to? In the verses, who's Paul writing to? He's writing to churches. He's writing to Christians. You see, the only way to truly grow in our walk with the Lord, the only way to truly grow in your relationship with Christ is to feel in your bones. I mean feel in your bones the goodness of the good news of the gospel. Now listen, don't get me wrong. You can learn a great many things about God and not give a rip about the gospel. There are numbers of people in seminary, they read big, fat, systematic theology books, and they don't care about the gospel. There, you can do a great many good things for God and not give a rip about the gospel. Pat was talking last week about being a deacon in his church, but not a Christian yet. That's exactly what was happening. Paul, or Pat was doing great things for God, but he didn't give a rip about the gospel. But if you want to really grow, like if you want actual Christian growth, like if you want the growth that actually matters, the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for us, it needs to capture your heart. Or for some of us, capture our hearts again. I was sitting in a coffee shop called Meshuggah on the loop. Don't judge me. It's delicious coffee. And uh, uh, it was uh, the fall of my senior year of college. I had been following Jesus for two and a half years at this point. I had been learning a great many things about God. I had I'd plowed through my lead Strobel. I would plowed through my John Piper. I was reading everything I could get my hands on. I was doing a great many good things for God. I'd just gotten back from spending a summer halfway across the world sharing the gospel with people. I was leading the largest Bible study on my college campus at that point. I had done a great many good things for God, but I was dying on the inside. So I picked up an article. It's actually this exact article right here at my church. I put the article on the table in front of me there at Meshuggah, and I began reading. And I, I got down to the very end of the first page. This is a different version. It's on the second page here. But I got down to the very end of the first page, and I read this sentence. The gospel is not just the ABCs of Christianity, but the A to Z of Christianity. A short, simple sentence. And it was like God had ripped open my chest and shown me exactly what my heart needed to hear. And it was awkward because I was in a coffee shop, but I spent the next two hours just like weeping and remembering the goodness of the good news of the gospel for me. He did all of it. I didn't deserve any of it. And I made a commitment at that table that for the rest of my life, I could screw everything else up. And I may still do that. We'll see. I could screw everything else up. But as for me and my one and only life, I want to be a gospel man. If you prick me, I want to bleed the good news of the gospel. That's the person I want to be. Can I be real with you guys? Last three months, I've been preparing this sermon series. I've been thinking about that day and that commitment over and over and over again. Church, when I pray for you, I don't pray that you'd be moral. 
When I pray for you, I don't pray that you'd be successful or influential. I don't even pray that you'd be happy. I pray that you would be gospel people. That the God of the universe would really allow you to feel, believe, and treasure the goodness of the good news of the gospel. Do you? There's few more significant things that you can do on a Sunday morning than to come here and to sit underneath the goodness and to think about the grace of God for you. Some of us, cards on the table, we're bored by this. Like, hey, when's pastor going to get more practical with us? I want to submit to you, if you find yourself bored by the gospel, that's a sin. You need to repent and ask God to allow you to feel the significance of his gospel again. Some of us, cards on the table, we just have to say, hey, I've never believed and I've never treasured that gospel. Today's the day. You come to Jesus as your rescuer and guess what he will do? He'll rescue you for his glory and your eternal, everlasting peace. Let me pray. Jesus, we love you. God, as we get to sit here and think about your grace, that you pronounce a new identity over us, that we are a new people in you because you rescued us, because you lived perfectly in our place, died sacrificially for all of our sins, and rose triumphantly for our hope. We get to sit here and bask in the goodness of that good news. God, I pray that we'd have eyes to see, hearts to feel the significance of what you've done for us. We love you, King Jesus. Thank you for your grace. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.